Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Rolf Grüter and I will be holding this course this semester. Uh, before we start, uh, uh, there's a little bookkeeping issue or housekeeping issue that I wanted to address with you and that is this course is given on Fridays. The semester has 14 weeks, so Good Friday we usually lose, so the course is made for 13 lectures. Now this year the school decided the last Friday, which is after a holiday, is no longer semester. So we only have 12 Fridays in the semester. Um, this poses a problem a bit because we have 13 courses. And the proposal I have here is that we hold course number seven, which is tracer kinetics, on one of the days in the week just before Easter. So it will not be on Friday, but on one of the, I will find a good time that suits most of your um, um, study plans. I'll find a lecture hall. Um, and it will be held after, usually it's, it's coming after course six, but in this case it will be held after course eight and nine because Easter is late this year. Are there any objections or all in favor? Is that fine? It's a short course, it's only 70 minutes, it's not 90 minutes, so we'll probably just do it in one piece. And then we'll just do after Easter um, in the problem in the exercise session, you can then ask questions concerning the problems of that week. Okay? All right. So, so for today's topic, which is the introductory course on the topic, we will deal with organization of the course first. Then I'll introduce to you what we understand, what we mean by bioimaging. I will address the importance of bioimaging, ending the course today with some examples. And at the end, you'll have the option to tour the Biomedical Imaging Center here at the EPFL. So let's discuss the organization of the course. This is our Moodle site. Um, it's under physics in the master program. And actually this year I didn't enroll you or we didn't enroll you, so this is the enrollment key that you would need, Bioimaging 14. Um, the copies of the presentation for today, you have them. And usually we will provide printed versions of the presentation in the course if there is not too much fluctuation in the attendance. We don't want to print too many copies that are unused. Otherwise, you can download them on Moodle. They're provided as a PDF link. And there is also from an older course, there are the PowerPoint slide presentations if you want to go through the animations that we use on the slides. But you, of course, have other options as well. Um, I strongly recommend that you still take notes I will say a lot of things, a lot of things will be said that are not necessarily on the slides. So I'm not going to read the slides to you. Um, OK, and if there's something unclear, make yourself heard by one way or another, because there's a 90% probability that you're not the only one that has problems of comprehension. Otherwise, um, of course, there are no stupid questions. Of course, I'm here during the break, after the course, and as well in the exercise session. I'll be here together with the two assistants. <coughs> so as much as you want to participate. The exercises are right after the course, and the assistants will bring them at the end of the course, uh, the problem sets printed out. They're also available as PDF on Moodle. 
We will then also provide the solutions of the problem sets from the prior week, um, a few days after the exercise session. Just one word on the exercises, on the problem sets. They are designed, we select the problems to typically revisit a topic that was handled in the course so that you have time to rethink what was the subject that was treated and to get more involved with the topic. Just listening to me lecture might be nice, but uh, this may not lead to um, a good understanding of the material. If you miss a course, you have two options. One is the course was filmed in 2011. The link is provided on Moodle as well, or on our lab website. That was done the first trial of recording the lecture. And the only thing there is with the way the recording was done, the animations on PowerPoint do not show, and the videos do not play fully the YouTube videos that we use to illustrate the material. For this year, uh, this is a second try. I've tried it out last fall with the first semester students for the physics course. So we recorded the lecture live. It was live broadcast on YouTube. And we're going to do the same thing here. So if you break a leg, you're at home, in the bed, can come here, you can actually observe it with roughly a 30 second delay in real time. So whatever I'm telling you now is being streamed live either on our Google Plus site or on our YouTube channel. Yes? No, no, it is. The nice thing that Google has done through YouTube is with Hangouts on Air, um, it's broadcast live, and then it's automatically available as high-definition video on the YouTube channel. So uh, and it turns out to be quite a success. I mean, the physics course, some videos have more than 2,000 views already beyond the students here at APFL. OK, so what is the content of this course? The first two lectures are primarily dealing with introduction. So what are the elements we will be treating? Is a definition and importance of bioimaging. That will be today. And next week, we'll talk about a brief introduction to ultrasound imaging. We're only going to briefly touch it. And then we're going to delve into the basis of x-ray imaging. Lectures 3 to 7 are dealing with x-ray imaging. So we're going to first talk about the interactions of photons with living tissue. Then we're going to talk about x-ray imaging, but only in the form of computed tomography, then em emission and positron emission tomography. The tracer dynamics course, as I said, it actually also applies to magnetic resonance imaging, which will be the topic of the rest of the course. So we're going to delay that to after lecture nine. Magnetic resonance, the lectures 8 to 10 will cover the essentials. So it'll be an introduction to magnetic resonance, the basis of the magnetic resonance effect. Um, T1 and T2 relaxation, you will learn what that is, spectroscopy, and how one generates echoes. And the last three lectures are dealing with advanced topics and contrast mechanisms in magnetic resonance imaging. Um, particularly elements of image formation, how do you generate an image, the bold effect, which is used for imaging brain function, contrast agents, and we'll end with a nice topic, and that is to measure diffusion in living tissue. So this course has links to other courses in your curriculum, and I'm sure this list is not complete, but uh, for the life scientists among you, where are the elements that we're going to use, where have you seen them already, that's systems and signals, image processing, and mathematical and computational models <coughs> in biology. And of course, the basic education. And for physics, at, uh, the, the elements that are most pertinent, apart from physics, of course, are neural networks and biological modeling in the master level and in the third year course, classical electrodynamics. OK, some of you might find that 
the material, the handouts are not enough, so there are some additional reading or material that we recommend. So this is the PDF of the lecture, what you see here on the screen. Again, if you just look at what is given to you, you don't take any notes, chances are you're going to miss on some key, miss out on some key explanations. So I suggest you take personal notes during the course. You also incorporate insights gained during the exercise. Like I said, the exercises are complementing the course. They're not necessarily just rehashing it. Sometimes there are elements in there that we have barely covered in the lecture. OK, now the main book that we recommend is this one. I've got a version here by Andrew Webb, Introduction to Biomedical Imaging. It is the closest to the course. Um, in terms of topic, it's not a very thick book. Um, these are the costs a few years ago. I don't know if they have changed, but you can also buy it on Amazon. It is more complete on MRI than what I'm going to be covering. It's an excellent reference text for later use. Here's a shorter text. That's Physics for Medical Imaging, by far. Um, that's this book here. It's also thinner, cheaper, but it has a lot of focus on classical x-rays. So it's more towards the interested medical doctor, simple chest x-ray, dental x-ray. We're not going to cover that part of imaging in the course. OK, so those are the two main books. This is the book that I refer to on Moodle. And the other part I need to mention here for Webb's book, it's available in electronic form at the library here at the EPFL. So you can get it in electronic form. Other textbooks, they are very complete, very elaborate. That's Cho, Foundations of Medical Imaging. Hendy and Rittnow, or Medical Imaging Physics, is more descriptive, less into the math and physics. And then a very detailed book, big book, is The Essential Physics of Medical Imaging by Bushberg. OK, so far for the lectures. OK, how many of you are familiar with all four images that are on the screen? Three, two, one. Never seen those images? OK, so let's look at them, what they are. We have on the left, that's actually also a way of imaging but we're not going to cover this type. Those are the X-ray diffraction uh, images taken by Rosalind Franklin of DNA. And this was the data that led Watson and Crick to propose this double helix structure of the DNA, for which they received the Nobel Prize in 1962. And one of these guys, at least one of them, is a physicist. This is an X-ray image of the hand. Do you know the hand, of whose hand this is? <coughs> the wife of Röntgen, yes. So he actually imaged the hand of his wife in 1895 or something like that. And he received for his work the Nobel Prize for in physics in 1901. It's actually the first Nobel Prize in physics. X-ray imaging for computer tomography was later developed in the 70s, and that's Cormac and Hounsfield that got the Nobel Prize. Also here, Cormac is a physicist in here. Then we have another type of imaging that's electron microscopy. That's electron microscopy of red blood cells. And here, Ruska was recognized for his work with the Nobel Prize, also a physicist. <laughs> and this here is the image of a human head with MRI. You see the eyeballs here. This is the midline of the brain. This is the back. It's a cut horizontally. We'll see those images more in the course. And for this, um, Lauterbur and Mansfield got the Nobel Prize in 2003. And the latter of the two is also a physicist. So you can already see the development of biomedical imaging has a lot to do with the importance of the insight into living tissue, but also, that is life sciences, but also with advances in physics. Interestingly, um, some of these Nobel Prizes were not given in physics, but in physiology or medicine. So 
what is biomedical imaging? What are we talking about here? And we're not talking here about taking a picture of someone that's taking images, but not imaging in that sense. So taking a nice picture of a living being from the outside with a camera, that, that is typically not considered biomedical imaging. And I'll give you here a very general definition specific to this course. Some people might use different definitions. This is the one that I personally like the most. And basically, it's the localized measurement. So localization is important. We want to know where this measurement comes from in the tissue of a contrast generating biophysical effect in a body or organ, and for this course, the definition is of a living system. We're going to deal with imaging of living things, of living beings, not of samples or tissues. OK, so what does contrast mean? I use the word contrast generating. What do we understand with contrast? And basically, contrast means it's the ability to distinguish features. You, of course, when you take your <coughs> cell phone, you take a picture, you have tons of contrast in there, because everyone is clearly identifiable. Everybody looks a little bit different, so we're clearly able to distinguish ourselves against the noise. And actually, with this type of imaging, there is no noise. There's so many photons with this nice light here. But if there was noise, if the room was dark, you would see that the ability to distinguish the features becomes poorer and poorer. And at midnight, a new moon, and it's completely dark, and there's a power outage in Ecublo, probably you'd have a hard time to even see anything on your camera. So contrast means basically we need to have a difference in signal between the two tissues that we'd like to distinguish. And I've already alluded to this. If we are in dark light, we have no light in the room, then we have no signal, and we have no contrast, and we can't distinguish who's sitting in the room because it's so dark. So in reality, what we need to deal with is contrast to noise. In every measurement, we have some form of noise. With these cameras, the noise is just so negligible that we usually don't deal with it. But there is also noise. And when you have to deal with noise, and the noise becomes bigger than the difference that you want to measure, or want to see, then you cannot distinguish the two tissues. So then you cannot distinguish your lecture here from the lecture hall because both are just noisy. OK, so what is measured? We'll deal here with some definitions. The image is usually measured as an n times m matrix of matrix elements, or here, picture elements. And somebody in this infinite visitum decided picture elements was too much to say, so they call it pixels. So that's basically just the matrix element in the image. A 3D image is an n times k times n times m matrix of voxels. Now you can guess what voxels stand for. Volume elements. So. The term nomenclature, at least, is consistent. So when we refer to, to an um, image, we refer to pixels. You've probably heard pixelation of images. We generally speak in imaging, in bioimaging, more of voxels. Um, but those terms might be used interchangeably. We're not going to deal too much with three-dimensional imaging in the course. That complicates matters too much. OK, so what is important here? is that we need to have contrast between pixels or voxels. They need to have a different grayscale. If you look at grayscale image or color scale image, they need to have a different color so that you can distinguish different tissue types. OK. So now, in principle, The 
n times n times k matrix is unlimited. You can generate, with most techniques, you can in principle generate a matrix of infinite number of elements. So, but there is a little problem here, and The question is, is there a free lunch for imaging? This is a theme that we're going to find over and over again. Do we have a free lunch? Can we just generate images with infinite resolution? You might guess the answer. As we decrease the resolution, or we go from right to left, as we increase the resolution, if we go from right to left, what are we doing with sensitivity and contrast? We typically decrease the sensitivity and the contrast to noise ratio. So imaging is always caught between the desire to have an as high as possible resolution, yet to maintain a sufficient contrast to noise ratio, that is, ability to distinguish features. If you take a camera like you have a CCD camera in your, in your handy, in your cell phone, you could generate a huge camera with lots of pixels, infinite number of pixels, but at some point you won't have enough photons in there to record a signal and generate a decent image. So what we will see throughout the course, and I'll start today with a generic example um, on how to address that in a few minutes, is that one of the big challenges in bioimaging is to find a compromise between the desire to have a good resolution and the need to have sufficient sensitivity or contrast to noise ratio. OK, so I've mentioned already the two terms. And let's see what is the difference between signal to noise ratio and contrast to noise ratio. OK, so to obtain good measurements, we all know that we need good signal-to-noise ratio. That is not just for bioimaging, that is for any measurement technique. And so the signal-to-noise ratio, if we define S as the signal or any measurement variable that we are actually deducing from our uh, data, and sigma as the standard deviation of that measurement, so that is either determined experimentally any idea how you can determine the variation, the standard deviation of a measurement? It Measure it many times, exactly. And if you're lucky, you have a normal distributed noise, so it's very easy to calculate. And if you're unlucky, you get some Poisson or some other weird distribution. So you can determine it either experimentally, then you have to do many measurements, or you estimate it quantitatively. Sometimes you can estimate the, 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 the standard deviation of the measurement um, by a calculation. So then the signal-to-noise ratio just becomes a signal over the standard deviation of its measurement. So this is, in a way, provides a means to estimate the precision by which the particular signal S is measured. It tells us if it's normally distributed, what is the confidence interval for 95% of the values being not different from another value, if you will? OK, so I would think, well, here's the story ends. I can stop it. But not really. You can have excellent signal-to-noise ratio, but no contrast-to-noise ratio. When is that possible? Yes. If the two signals are too close, if the overlap is too, too good. Yes. Do we have examples in the room? Yeah, you were looking to the left or to the right. That's good direction. The green stuff there. Okay. 
if you take a picture of the green where it's flat, where there's no shadows, there is no contrast. It's excellent signal to noise. Or take the white here, this surface. I won't be able to distinguish what's on the surface. I just see there's a surface. But on the surface, I have no features. So I have no contrast. Even though, if I take the picture, everybody agrees. We have excellent signal to noise ratio. So there is no difference in signal. Within the error of the signal, then we don't have contrast. So to distinguish two signals, S1 and S2, we'll just call them S1, S2, we need to have the variation in the signal, the standard deviation, to be substantially smaller. And that's the contrast to noise ratio. So let's start with the definition. S1 and S2 are two signals or two measurement variables of two different tissues or two different pixels. Sigma is the standard deviation of their measurement. That's the same devi de definition as on the left. And here, we'll just assume for simplicity that that standard deviation is the same for both signals. And that usually is a good assumption. We'll also assume that they're statistically independent. And then the contrast to noise ratio is defined here as the difference of the signals divided by the standard deviation. So that, that measurement here gives us a means to estimate the precision with which S1 can be distinguished from S2. Where you say this contrast to noise ratio has to be to be effectively to be able to distinguish two different signals, S1 and S2, that's a different debate. We'll not go into it at this point. OK, so how can we optimize the signal to noise ratio? Any ideas? <coughs> OK, good experimentation. Have a good machine. That's obviously one. But let's say you have a given machine, you have a given imager. What can you do to improve the signal to noise ratio to optimize it? Well, one way to do it is to repeat the measurement n times. So we'll just do the measurement over and over again. You do some averaging. That's actually some of those video cameras that have excellent night shot quality. That's what they effectively do. They measure so many times, and then they average. So the precision of the average is then, um, and here's the average of the signal, is given by the number of samples. Let's say we do S repeated samples with the index i. The average is then given by Num sum of the SI divided by N. And this, of course, as we all know, depends on the square root law. This means if we want to double the signal to noise ratio, we have to measure four times as many samples. So let's look at this uh, as an example here. For some of you, it might be trivial. So we have the signal SI is given by the true plus the error epsilon i. And epsilon i, the expectation value of epsilon i squared is sigma squared. And we assume that the noise has an expectation value, a mean expectation value of 0. So s is the unknown true signal. And if we now write the measured s, the average, this is si over n. This is given by s plus the sum of epsilon i over n. And now we'll define delta s as the measured average minus the true signal, and that's given by this value here, the sum of the epsilon i over n. And now we'll just take this delta s squared. This gives us the, this sum here squared, which we can parcel into two terms. One are the epsilon i squared, and then we have the epsilon i times epsilon j, where epsilon i is unequals to j. That's just summing out uh, this part. And now we have a nice feature for uncorrelated noise. So the noise in the i-th measurement is uncorrelated from the noise of the j-th measurement. And that means that the expectation value of epsilon i and epsilon j is 0 if i and j are not the same. So this term averages out to 0, which is usually holds true if we have reasonably good signal-to-noise ratio. And then we only have 
the sum of epsilon i squared. That's the expectation value. And we now get delta s squared is sigma squared over n. So the error improves by the standard deviation of the individual measurement by square root of n. That's the standard square root of n law for standard error of mean. It comes from statistics. To make a long story short, what it means, once we have a given instrument set up, a given setting, a given detector, and pretty much the only means that we have to improve signal-to-noise ratio is to measure more and more. And since this goes with the square root of n law, every effort that is done on the instrumentation side to have a good measurement will pay off very rapidly in reduced measurement time. And if you're a patient going for an MRI, for a CT, or a PET, or a SPECT scan, whatever scan you want, you want to be sure that people have done everything they can to have maximized the performance of the scanner because the penalty you pay, pay here is, is huge. Give you an example. If you want to increase the spatial resolution by a factor of two, so you want to reduce the voxel dimensions by a factor of two, that means your voxel size reduces by a factor of eight. To get the same signal to noise ratio, you would have to increase the SNR by a factor of eight. That means you increase the measurement time by a factor of 64. So a scan that takes one minute for a resolution of, say, two millimeter isotropic, if you want to go down to one millimeter but maintain the signal to noise ratio, you'll be in there for 64 minutes or an hour. That's the price you pay. And that's why it's crucial to understand how the imaging modalities are optimized and improved and where are the compromises that one has to take. Okay, so now we'll deal with contrast to noise ratio and the question is how can we optimize contrast to noise ratio? And also here, there are empirical ways to do it. That is, you just measure and measure and measure and figure out what parameters of your modality are the good ones. And so, but sometimes we have actually some knowledge about the signal to behavior and that allows us to deduce um, the optimal contrast to noise ratio. And actually what it means in imaging, in biomedical imaging, optimizing contrast to noise ratio basically means we're going to look at the set of experimental parameters that define our imaging modality to find ex those experimental parameters, that is a protocol, that maximizes the difference between two tissues that is the difference in signal from two tissues, say, S1 and S2. In practice, it's a complex and empirical procedure, but some of the behavior can be modeled and gives us already some feeling of how the signal behaves. So, and particularly one requirement here is that we can model the signal behavior as a function of the underlying biophysical mechanisms on one hand and the imaging modality, the experimental parameters. Okay, so I will give you the exa example here. It's very generic, very general, but we will be seeing this kind of calculation several times in the course, and that's why I thought I'll bring it already uh, today. And basically we'll do this on a error propagation calculation. And so on. we'll now suppose that the signal is a function of k and t. Okay? So k and t has already some feeling there, but what we mean by k, it's a tissue property. So k is a property of the signal that's linked to a given tissue. It can be a signal decay rate, and very often we'll see in the course this is indeed the case. And T can be an experimental parameter. Can be an experimental parameter such as time. Some timing in the experiment, in the imaging protocol. But it is an experimental parameter, and what this means is it's a parameter that the operator, that the user can choose. We have a degree of freedom, how we, what time T we choose. Let's just assume that. 
The tissue property is intrinsic to the subject. That we cannot choose. That's given. That's a property we want to measure, or the influence of that property on the image we want to measure. T is an experimental parameter. So those two things we need to distinguish here. What is the approach now that's taken? First, we're going to calculate the derivative of the signal with respect to the tissue property K, dS over dK. That gives us an idea how much the signal changes by varying the underlying tissue property K. And then we're going to find the T0 at which this dS over dK is maximal. OK? And that is done by simply taking the derivative of dS over dK with respect to the experimental parameter T. OK, so that's very theoretical. I'll give you an example here. Let's assume we have a signal S of K and T, which is given by S0 times an exponential decay, minus KT. Again, K here. Tissue parameter T is what I can choose to measure at. OK, so now we want to know how much does the signal vary if one varies K, the tissue parameter. OK, usually tissue parameter is a given thing. But in physics, we always pretend we can change things. So we're going to just pretend we can have tissues with different parameters K. So if we now take the derivative, that is the change of the signal, when we change k, we get minus s0 times t times e to the minus kt. And now we want to know where does this function have a maximum? Before we go into the math, which is not very difficult, let's look at this function. So the change of signal with respect to t is 0 at t equals 0. OK? e to the minus kt, if t is 0, is 1. t is 0, so it's 0. Well, basically, the parameter k, the tissue parameter, has not had a chance to affect the signal if we measure at time 0. So measuring at time 0 is obviously a stupid choice. What if we measure at time equals t equals infinity? OK, so t goes to infinity. e to the minus kt goes to 0. And if you look at the terms closely, you'll see that e to the minus kt goes faster to 0 than t goes to infinity. So t times e to the minus kt goes to 0 again. Mathematically, how is this to visualize? Well, if you measure an exponential decay at infinite time, you've got no signal, no matter what the k is. It's just always 0. So again, you cannot distinguish the the two tissue types. So conclusion, it's somewhere in between, between 0 and infinity. At least we've narrowed it down. All right? Yeah, I'm not doing a good job here, huh? So let's do some math. All right, so I'll just take the derivative of this function with respect to t. Uh, we want to know where that derivative is 0, because that's where the maximum is. We get these two terms, the two derivatives. We take out the terms that are common. This has to be 0. And now we'll find t0 is 1 over k. Isn't that a beautiful result? So simple. The optimum time to measure a decay rate is to measure at 1 over the decay rate at that time. That's where you're most sensitive to. So that means for an exponentially decaying signal, the optimal time of measurement is equal to 1 over the decay rate. How critical is this choice of t0? Do we have to be on it down to seven significant digits or what? Well, let me ask you the other way around. I told you this is the optimum to measure changes with k the decay rate. But now you're going to tell me, well, but in tissue, we're going to have two different decay rates. So with respect to which decay rate k should I choose my t0? Let's see if have a k that's small and a k that's large. Which one over k do you choose for your t0? 
Because there's, if you're around, you know, if you take the derivative ds over dk at a given k, k value, then you got the variation there. But if they're fairly distant apart, you no longer have a clear optimum for the two. So the question is, how critical is this choice of t0? And so we'll just plot here this function. So this is now t times e to the minus kt normalized. So the maximum is 1 times k as a function of kt. So I just treated kt as a variable here. And this is the change of the variation with respect to t. And this is t0 where the optimum is. t0 is where kt0 is equal to 1. So that's where the optimum is. Now you can see that's a fairly benign function. It's got a flat maximum, so it's actually not so critical what is the exact t0. You have to have an idea of what your decay rate is. Your decay rate is 10 seconds, and you measure at a time of 5 hours. You're obviously not doing a good measurement. If your decay rate is 10 seconds, and you measure at a time of 1 nanosecond, you're obviously not good either, so you have to have some idea. But once you're here in the range up here, you can actually see, and we'll come back on that, that you have almost a three-fold variation in T0 or in K, K, 1 over K that you can have here, and you're only compromising 10% of your, of your signal or of your contrast-to-noise ratio. And 10% squared is 80%. That's a 20% increase in measurement time that we can afford. If you're one minute in the scanner or one minute and what's a fifth of a minute, 12 seconds, most people don't mind. OK, I think we'll leave it at that. We'll break here and continue at a quarter past.